Welcome everyone, my name is Christina and I'm going to be your host for today's NATO Live Online. Now if you've been watching NATO Live Online, welcome back and thank you for being there. And if you're new, let me tell you a little bit about these shows. In NATO Live Online, we bring scientists uh, from the museum to talk about the collections that they look after. Um, and NATO Live Online was born last year when the pandemic hit uh, in March, uh, when we decided to keep doing this show which used to happen at the natural history museum in london and bringing these stories these scientists these collections the natural history museum to your homes now if you've been enjoying nature life online consider giving the museum at the nation you can do that uh, via the chat if you're watching from youtube there's a button near the chat board or you can go directly to our website if you're watching from anywhere else and um and donate from there we'll post um a link to the website on the chat uh, we are closed at the moment and any help is always really appreciated now a quick reminder as well that these shows are live so while I'm chatting to one of our scientists, feel free to send comments, send your questions, and I'll try to get through as many questions uh, as possible with our scientists. We really, really look forward to hearing from you. Now, without any further ado, today we are going to celebrate World Penguin Day, which was actually last Saturday. Um, but today we're going to be joined by Dr. Alex Bond from the museum, and he'll tell us more about these flightless birds. Let's say hello to Alex. Hi, Alex. Hi, Christina. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for joining us. And thank you so much for talking about penguins with us. I'm really excited about that. But before we start talking about these birds, can you tell us a little bit about what do you do at the museum? What's your role and what do you do there? Sure. So I'm in charge of the Natural History Museum's bird collection. We've got about a million specimens, um, but we're not based in London. We're uh, at the museum site at Tring in West Hertfordshire. Brilliant, Alex. So today we're taking you from the whole collection of birds and focusing on uh, on on these flightless birds, which I think you're a fan of, as your T-shirt can tell us already. There you go. Um, and we'll talk about the penguin that you've got in your T-shirt uh, in a little bit as well, um, because that's one of the things when we think about penguins. We think about the emperor penguin, the one that's been in all our TVs, even on cinema screen, and um, the one that lives in Antarctica in the cold, raises his um, its one only chick. But there is more penguins than just the emperor, um, and that's why I'm really ha happy to have Alex here uh, for us. Uh, so, Alex, can you tell us a little bit more about where in the globe, aside from Antarctica, we can find penguins? Yeah, sure. So, yeah, we all think of penguins. We think Antarctica, Morgan Freeman narrating, you know, dramatically in the background, but they exist in warm places too, like the Galapagos Islands that you see here. Um, penguins are found in New Zealand, Australia, South Africa, Namibia, all up the west coast of South America um, and the Galapagos, uh, Galapagos Islands. So they're really found, yeah, in a variety of perhaps not terribly intuitive places where you wouldn't think penguins would be. We can see the map there and you can see in orange the areas where you find. Um, as you said, the, the areas where you've described it, also some remote islands in the um, Atlantic, the Pacific, the Indian Ocean. Um, but they're all in the southern hemisphere. They don't cross the equator. The one that goes further north are just the Galapagos penguins, which I suppose live in, in the Galapagos, right? Yeah, exactly. So Galapagos penguins are <laughs> This north are just shy of the equator. So yeah, in, in penguins, they're only found in the southern hemisphere. No penguins in the northern hemisphere, nothing like it. There's similar things to penguins. Um, there's one uh, extinct bird that looked a lot like penguin, the gray ox, right, Alex? But that's not a penguin. No, exactly. So um, great ox, uh, as the names suggest, is an auk. Uh, so it's related to things like puffins and guillemots that we might be more familiar with. But their scientific name was Pinguinus, um, which is where the word penguin comes from, even though they're not that closely related. Um, but they were flightless, um, were black and white, and you can see, uh, at least on the surface, they look quite similar. Now, on the surface, but you brought um, uh, two skulls 
one is from a penguin and another one is from a, a, a great org, I think. Um, could you show them to the camera so people can see how different they are? Don't tell them which one is which yet. Oh, all right. Let's all see right. if we can figure it out. <laughs> so we've got, uh, we've got two skulls here, one on one side, one on the other side. <laughs> um, so this is the great auk um, and, and this is the penguin. And you can see, you know, they, they really do look quite different. Everything from the shape of the bill, the size of the eyes, um, and even the ridges on their head. So yeah, while they might look similar on the outside, on the inside, they do look quite different. They do, they do. You wouldn't, I don't know, like when you see them on the outside, or you said they look, they have similar external features, but then those two schools look very different. Um, now, if the orcs, um, the puffins, the ones that, the flying lesbets, um in the Northern Hemisphere are not the closest relatives, what are the closest relatives of, of penguins then, Alex? Because I think that's a, it's, it's a little bit surprising, isn't it? It is because, you know, penguins, Famously, don't fly, um, and their closest relatives are some of the most amazingly fly, amazing flying seabirds. So, albatrosses and petrels. So, albatrosses that can spend decades at sea without touching land, um, and petrels that can just soar on the ocean waves. Yeah, these are the most closely related uh, species to penguins, which is not necessarily what you think from looking at them. Uh, that's incredible um and but i suppose when you look at all the features you start seeing the similarities there that you won't see on the on the great org like you can see on the on the schools those are the secrets of um ornithology i suppose um now i want to take this opportunity alex to remind people that um i've got loads of questions for alex but you can send your own questions as well. So if you have any questions about penguins, any questions for Alex, send them through the chat. And as I said before, uh, we'll try to get through as many as possible. Um, but let's go back to penguins, Alex. Let's have a look at uh, the diverse environments where they live. We had a look at the map, but let's have a look at them in there. And I think we're going to start with the northerly, the most northerly penguin, the Galapagos Island penguin. We can see them um, roasting on some rocks there. Tell us a little bit more about them. They live in the Galapagos Islands, as the name indicates, I suppose. Yeah, obviously. Um, so <laughs> un unlike emperor penguins, um, Galapagos penguins, they're a bit smaller. Um, they they breed in burrows in the ground um, or in rock crevices. So you can see them here on the volcanic rock of the Galapagos. Um, and unlike the emperor penguins, um, they'll lay actually two eggs every year, whereas the emperor penguins will only lay one every other year. Um, so, you know, even though they're both penguins, um, they are quite different. And um, living on the equator in a, in a warm place, um, are their behaviours and habits much different to, to, the, to the emperor penguin, um, but also or all the penguins as well, living in, in such warmer areas? Yeah, yeah. So, um, I mean, Penguins are, are well insulated. I mean, we, we, we know that coming from, you know, thinking of our emperor penguin friends. Um, but, uh, you know, they, that insulation works just as well in, in warm environments. If you put um, something cold into a, an insulated flask, it'll stay cold. If you put something warm in, it'll stay warm. And penguins are kind of almost the same way. Um, so yeah, they're really well adapted to the places where, they, where they're found. And that can be, you know, off the coast of Southern Africa and the Galapagos, off the coast of Peru. Um, or in the rainforests uh, of New Zealand. So, yeah, so like peng African penguins, you know, frolicking on the sand <laughs> of South Africa is not exactly what you think of as a penguin, but it is just as much a penguin as uh, the emperor penguins sitting on the, on the ice shelf in Antarctica. We've seen a couple of pictures there of all the penguins as well that live in, in warmer areas with different behaviours, different um, ways that they live. Now, Alex, you mentioned the insulation in the emperor penguin, and actually you have a really cool specimen there that you brought from the museum collection, and I think we should show it now, um, because as you said, their skin is really adapted to live in the cold. How, can we have a look at, at the skin um, of the emperor penguin? Yeah, sure. So, um, so birds, unlike mammals, have that layer of fat that's between their skin and their muscle. But even on the outside, the skin and the feathers are an amazing insulation. So what we have here is a bit of a penguin tail. Um, and if you look at it on the side, just look at how thick those feathers are. I, I can't press down on that and, and compress them. Each one of these is an individual feather. 
Um, and if you look on the underside, you can see each of those little points is the place where a feather connects to the skin. So the feathers are just so incredibly dense and thick that, you know, this, this is exactly why emperor penguins are so well adapted um, to living in such cold environments. That's incredible. Like seeing the th thickness of that and the, the t little markings on the other side, I thought it was the preparation, but no, it's actually the markings of the feathers. That's that's incredible, Alex. I think people could really see how thick that was. Now we had, we, we were looking at the picture of um, an African penguin. You said already that the insulation works work both ways. Um, so do they keep them not too warm in the warmer areas then? Exactly. So in uh, the more tropical species like this African penguin, um, you know, they're, again, just as well adapted to living in these warm places um, as the emperor penguins are to living in the cold. So they've got um, insulation that helps you know, regulate their body temperature. They breed in burrows, which helps regulate the temperature a little bit. It sort of buffers it against those extremes when they're on the nest. Um, so just like these two little penguins that you find in Australia. <laughs> Uh, and New Zealand, these two chicks. So yeah, every every species is, is pretty well adapted to its um, the habitats in which it's found. That's amazing. Now, Alex, we had a couple of questions already coming through um, and uh, they're excellent questions. So the first one is from um, Dylan Paul, who is asking, is there evolutionary advantage to being black and white for the penguins? I think that's something that they all have in common um, in there. So is there something, is there an advantage there? That's a great question. Um, there's a couple of different theories, but the one that probably has the most weight is um, basically it's camouflage. If you're looking at something from above on the ocean, it's gonna be dark. And if you're looking at something from underneath, um, that light is gonna be similar to the light you see coming through. So it's a way of, of essentially, cam not camouflage, but uh, a way of, of essentially blending in and, and looking much more like the environment. That's amazing. And the, all of them swim, so all of them have that. That's incredible. And and another question as well um, from our viewers, from Tess, they're asking, uh, does the Natural History Museum in London have a specimen of extinct fossils, fossil penguins? And are there many extinct species of, of penguins that we know of? Yeah, there's about 50 penguins that we know only from fossil remains. And there's only 18 species that are around right now. And yes, the museum has a fantastic collection in our paleontology department um, of a whole variety of fossil penguins, which are just absolutely amazing. Some of them quite, were quite big as well. They were, they, I mean, as, as fossils of, of ancient animals, they tend to be quite big. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, they're penguins that were, you know, five, six feet tall, for goodness sakes, uh, especially from New Zealand. So um, yeah, they, they look very similar to the ones that we see today, um, but yeah, also quite different. <laughs> Um, and Alex, uh, our last question from our, of our audience so far, but please keep sending them through. Uh, we have a question from Theo. They're asking, can I ask, what is the main source of nutrition for the chinstrap penguin? Do you know that? Yeah, yeah. So chinstrap penguins breed in uh, islands around Antarctica, and they're really specialized on eating krill. So tiny little shrimp. Um, and you'd think, that's how on earth can a, you know, a penguin survive on eating that? But just like you know, just like blue whales survive off krill, um, so too does the chin strap penguin. She's working hard and finding exactly. the food every day. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, Alex, going back to um, uh, the, the penguins and, and my questions as well, another fact that we see about the emperor penguins we see in our documentaries as well, I think you mentioned it before, is the one egg that they lay, the one egg that they put all the energy in, they look after. You've got one over there as well. There you go. One egg. Yeah, um, it's, do they it's pretty play? big, but that's the only leg that they'll lay in, in a year. And is it, do they like just one egg to put all the energy in it? Because if it's quite, um, it, it costs a lot in terms of energy to have that. Yeah, exactly. So um, emperor penguins, because they've got to trek across the ice and then go find food and then bring it back, they can only manage to raise one chick. Um, it just wouldn't be possible energetically uh, to look after two at the same time. But you said that the Galapagos penguins lays two eggs, and he's not the only penguin that lays two eggs. And in fact, there's some differences there, right? Um, can you tell us more about the two eggs? How does that work? Why do they lie two eggs? 
what's going on. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so what I've got here are two eggs from uh, a Fjordland crested penguin from New Zealand. Um, they lay two eggs. Um, one is almost, I guess, an, an insurance policy. Um, when conditions are really great, um, they can raise two chicks. But if conditions are average, then it's okay just laying one. So just like all birds, um, you know, penguins don't know what the breeding uh, situation is going to be in terms of food uh, in a couple of weeks or a couple of months after they lay their eggs. So they basically have to hedge their bets. Um, and in the crested penguins, like the rock hopper on my shirt or the Fjordland crested penguin, the interesting thing is it's quite different from other birds, is that the first laid egg, the A egg, is smaller than the B egg or the second lay laid egg. It's usually the other way around. Um, and that's, uh, we, don't, we don't really know why. Um, it's a whole, you know, question of, you know, evolution of, of breeding cycles. But yeah, that smaller egg is less likely to hatch and, and result in a fledged chick, but it's there just in case. And amazing, I always find amazing when you guys tell us, we still don't know what it is. We still need to find out because that's, that's part of, uh, of science. We can see one of the crested penguin chicks over there. I think this photo is yours as well, Alex. Um, and we can see them popping out after it's, it's hatched from the egg. They're really cute. And you can see the difference between the emperor penguin's egg and the little um, crested penguins as well there. Um, Alex, so many questions coming in from our viewers. Really good questions as well. Um, Dory is asking, why is the little penguin blue? I think we have a, a you actually have a specimen of that one uh, over there. Um, does that have an evolutionary advantage? It's kind of like dark bluish, almost black, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, why, why is the emperor penguin blue? Why, why does a robin have a red breast? Uh, you know, <laughs> fantastic questions, but ultimately, you know, we, we don't really know the answer. I mean, all, all the penguins are, are light underneath um, and darker on the back. And why little penguins ended up slightly bluer, in some places they're called blue penguins. Um, yeah, I'm not really sure uh, that we've figured that one out yet. There you go, another question to answer uh, there. Um, and Alex, Steve, who is sending greetings from Canada, um, you might know Steve, I think, um, they, they're asking, how do penguin dines vary, vary in the colder and warmer habitats? Do they vary? Um, yeah, so around Antarctica, a lot of them are eating krill because that's what's really abundant um, around there, whereas the ones that are more tropical tend to eat more fish, so things like anchovies. And that's just because that's what's found in those really strong upwelling currents, so like the Humboldt current off the west coast of South America, or the Agullas and Minguela currents off the coast of South Africa, um, you know, bringing nutrients up from the bottom of the ocean, um, which results in these large stocks of essentially what we call forage fish, anchovies and herrings and that sort of thing. Those are delicious, to be honest. So, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I was just thinking about food now. Um, that was really a brilliant question as well. Uh, now, any other questions, please keep sending them through. Like the one that we, I'm going to ask you now, um, Alex, um, Chris is asking, what penguins live in the Falkland Islands? Oh, yeah. Do a they bunch live of there? Species. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's some fantastic penguins in the Falklands. Um, there's southern rockhoppers, which are crested. Um, so kind of like the northern rockhopper that I've got here. But with <laughs> shorter crests. Um, uh, they've got king penguins there. I'm not sure if they've got Magellanic penguins or not. I can't remember if they go that far south. But yeah, there's a couple of different species in, in the Falklands and some of them you can see um, if you travel there as, uh, as a tourist. That's brilliant. Um, thank you so much for all your questions. These are excellent. Um, and I just want to remind everyone, if you want to make a donation, we always really appreciate it. So you can donate directly from YouTube. There's a button uh, nearby the chat or you can go uh, to our website. But yeah, keep sending questions. We get into the end of the show, Alex, though. Um, and we had actually a really good questions that I wanted to ask you. Um, but we got it as well from Pauline, um, who is watching us. Um, Pauline was asking, are we noticing um, any changes, any changes in penguin health and popul or population or um, any changes um, in their behavior due to the current rate of climate change? And that was something that I wanted to talk about it. What, is, what sort of stresses are they um, suffering, penguins, in, in, in the areas where they live, living in such remote areas, some of them as well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, penguins, like many seabirds, are, are not doing particularly well. Their populations are declining. And that's a result of a variety of different things. 
climate change, obviously warming the oceans, um, which is changing the distribution of their food. Unlike other birds, penguins can't fly. They've got to swim, which is takes a lot of energy. Um, you know, yeah, anyone who's who's gone swimming knows that it's a lot of energy to swim pretty far. And even for penguins, um, that's that's the case, even though they're so well adapted. The farther they've got to go, the more energy it takes. Um, and at breeding colonies, you've got things like habitat destruction. So um, penguins that breed in, you know, grass forests or rainforests. Um, yeah, so like these little penguins here. <laughs> and the northern rock upper penguins that we see here from, from Gulf Island and South Atlantic Ocean, um, you know, that habitat isn't necessarily the most, uh, the most stable or is under threat from a variety of other things. And then introduced predators at breeding colonies. So Gulf Island has introduced mice. They seem to be leaving the penguins alone. Um, they just got rid of mice rats uh, from South Georgia, which is a fantastic penguin breeding island. Um, so yeah, there's a whole variety uh, bycatch uh, in fisheries, getting caught in fishing gear. So yeah, there's a lot of things that penguins have to deal with um, that are ultimately our fault. So not, not only um, climate change, but ultimately all the pressures that we are um, basically putting on top of them um, it, from many different angles um, as humans, right, Alex? Yeah, exactly. So of the 18 penguin species, nine are globally threatened and five of those are endangered. So um, yeah, they're one of the most threatened seabird families um, that we've got on the planet. Oh my god! Um, now, Alex, you've you've seen these penguins in uh, in the remote islands, some of the remote islands that you've you've visited as well. This picture that we're seeing at the moment um, is one of yours. is is from the is the northern um, rock copper, uh, the one that we're seeing over there. Um, now, those islands are um, I think some of them are British sea territories, and this links with something that you told me that the UK is responsible for I think a third of the worldwide population of penguins why why is that why does the uk have that responsibility yeah you wouldn't think the uk uh being you know responsible for so many penguins and it's not as though they're you know washing uh, you know uh, rocking up on the coast of of dorset or, or northumberland or something like that but you know they do breed in the british uh, uk overseas territories so tristan de Kuna and gulf island falkland south georgia and south sandwich islands um and the british Antarctic territory um, and so, yeah, in, in that way, the UK is responsible for something like a third of um, the total number of penguins uh, that we see in the world, which is something that not a lot of folks necessarily think about. And um, are there any conservation efforts, even spearheaded by the UK, since they have that responsibility or any other countries going on at the moment to, to protect those threatened species? Any, anything that the humans are doing to protect um, these animals? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's lots of education around um, fishing fleets and fishing regulators. Um, the RSPB is getting rid of introduced mice on Gulf Island this year. Um, the South Georgia Heritage Trust got rid of mice and rats from South Georgia a few years ago. So yeah, there's there's still quite a lot of work to do in terms of you know looking after these guys. And we've got uh, in the UK certainly um, a reasonably large responsibility to do so. That's amazing. Um, now, Alex, we're getting to, to the very, very end of the show. Um, but I just want to say thank you to Dylan Paul, who, Dylan Paul who's um, sent us our donation, which is really, really nice. And also we had a question for um, Sawal Fox, who was asking, how do penguins drink? Yeah, uh, so actually, uh, penguins get all of their water from their food. And they've got these fantastic glands. Uh, if we look at the skull again, just up in here, which is called a salt gland, which means that um, they can ingest salt water and excrete it. Um, so they drink either seawater or they get all of their water uh, from the fish and, and krill that they eat. That's amazing. Now, such such a special um, such a spe special animal, such special birds, and um, I'm glad that we were able to discover with you the ones that we're not used so so used to seeing on our screens, maybe not so used to seeing um, in the media so much, and, and discover how um, where around the world they they live and how do they live. Now, Alex, sadly, we've reached uh, near the end of the show. Well, I'm going to have to say goodbye to you really, really soon. But I want to say thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you so much for celebrating World Penguin Day with us and, and open the door to the to the um, Southern Hemisphere world of penguins. Um, but I'm going to say goodbye to you for now, Alex, but hopefully because there's so many other birds in the world, 
see you in the future with more bird content. Yeah, we certainly hope so. Thanks very much, Christina. <laughs> thank you so much, Alex. Um, and thank you so much as well to everyone watching behind the screens. Uh, we're really, really excited to be here and have you there. Um, thank you so much for your questions as well. They were excellent. And also thank you so much for your donation. If you enjoyed the show, uh, consider giving us uh, a donation. You can donate in the button on uh, YouTube or we'll put links on the chat as well so you can go directly to our website. Um, just remember that the museum is closed at the moment, although it will be reopening soon. So if you go to our website, you'll be able to see how to book tickets for free uh, to have a socially distant um, visit to our museum and Trink, the museum where Alex work and where you can see all the birds in our collection will also be reopening soon. So check that out as well if you live in the Tring area or if you want to go for a, um, a weekend trip to that museum. It's such a lovely museum and all our birds are there and Alex might be there too. So you'll be able to ask questions to him as well yourself. Um, but Without any further ado, before I say goodbye to you, just remind you the Nature Live happens every Tuesday at 12.30 p.m. in the in the UK. And we have so much more exciting content ready for you and coming up in the upcoming weeks. Now, next week, my colleague Alistair will be chatting with um, curator Richard Sabin and conservationist um, Lorraine Cornish about the great exhibition that happened in South Kensington in London 170 years before and how it was important to create the Natural History Museum and all the museums in that area. But aside from that, if you want to know more about Nature Life or any other museum programs, uh, keep an eye on our social media channels um, and you'll be able to keep up, up to date with that. You can also check our YouTube channel for past shows. Um, but uh, that's all from me today. I'm going to say once again, thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for your questions and see you next time. Bye bye.